John 17, take your Bible, turn there, and I will uh, update you on my, my condition. Um, I, uh, of course, we mentioned uh, Sunday, we went to um, uh, urgent care on Wednesday, and uh, they didn't, they didn't see any diverticulitis and you know, anytime you have pain or anything like that, you worry that you maybe have a tumor of some kind. Cancer is just rampant everywhere, and uh, I hate it. And so you kind of worry about that. So when they give you a report that they don't really see anything significant there, you go, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And um, so anyway, uh, the pain persisted. We went to the ER last Friday. And um, they did a, an x-ray of my abdomen, and then they did an ultrasound of it, and they found a, um, a gallbladder full of stones, gallstones. And so um, I followed up with my primary physician, or his, um, his nurse practitioner, um, and she was very nice. Uh, she was very, very professional in how she dealt with everything. And um, she, she wasn't really convinced that, uh, that the, where I was saying it was hurting was related to the gallbladder. But I had talked to Rose uh, um, yesterday or today or Monday, I don't remember. But anyway, Rose said that when she hurt, hers was hurting here. And over here, and I'm going, well, that's me. And uh, so then the next day, Tuesday, I, I had an appointment with uh, the surgeon. And he looked at the, um, the report from uh, the ultrasound. And basically, it was a, it was a very fairly quick visit. Uh, he said, um, you're either going to see me now with this or you're going to see me later with this, but you're going to see me take your gallbladder out. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I thought I was supposed to be asleep during this. Some of you will catch that in a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I do want to be asleep. But uh, that was his suggestion. He said, let's, let's get it out. Because if, if you don't get it out now with, with what you have in there, eventually it will cause problems. And it, it, you don't want it to be an emergency situation where they got to get you to the hospital and get this thing out. Because those things could uh, lead to infections and all kinds of bad, evil things that I don't want to happen. And so now it's, um, it's going to be a controlled situation. They called uh, this morning and scheduled the surgery for next Monday, um, which is, what day is that? 15th, 15th, May 15th, uh, at noon, uh, over here. And um, that should give me enough time to get back on my feet for Sunday. Uh, it was important to me to not get it before this Sunday service. This is Mother's Day coming up. I wouldn't want to miss that one. And, um, but then they're doing it early enough in the week on a Monday to where it's, it's possible. In fact, I'm going to say I'm going to be here that Sunday. I am. Uh, I may be sitting in my stool up there. Uh, but I've done this before. When I had the hernia repair, uh, we did something unique. Uh, I, had, um, I had it set up where I was going to teach the Sunday school class. And then I had four men in the church that were going to, they were going to help me preach. There's nothing unbiblical about that. Stephen uh, and the deacons... Uh, this, the first seven deacons chosen, they were preachers. They went out and preached everywhere. And um, so anyway, we um, set it up to where four men 
came one at a time and they just gave their testimony. And I tell you, I was never so more glad that I set it up that way because by the time that Sunday rolled around, I thought I was in pretty good shape. And um, when I stood up to do Sunday school, just kind of like I do now, I started reading the scriptures and all of a sudden, I didn't have no breath. I was like totally um, emaciated. My body had been fighting this, um, this tear in my body, uh, fixing this hernia, putting this mesh in and all the things they did. And it had been healing itself. And I had no energy at all. And I didn't know it because I'd been resting all week. And I got up during Sunday school and just tried to read the scriptures. And I was like, <sighs> I was completely out of breath. So we had um, had some men help us. So uh, what I might do is pick on some men. Unless y'all want to go completely off the rails and have me pick four women. Okay. I can do it. But, um, but anyway, I might do that just for backup. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but anyway, that will, um, hopefully I'll be on my feet enough. I'm going to rest that week and, um, then hope for the best that Sunday. So I appreciate everybody's prayers, uh, for me, the ones you've given already. I appreciate it and just pray that this puts an end to what I've been going through. Um, I'm hoping it will. And uh, so we'll we'll see. We'll see. But um, anyway, again, next Monday at noon, um, if you would just uh, say a little prayer for don't pray for me. I'm on the table. I'm asleep. If they mess something up real bad, I'm going to heaven and won't know it until I get there. I'm going, oh, this is how it is. Um, but just pray for the doctor. Pray for uh, my family. Just pray. Just pray that God will God will bring us along. All right. Um, so that's what's going on with me. Um, there was something else I was going to say too. I can't remember what it was. All right, John chapter seventeen. Um, tonight I, I've I've got some notes here. Uh, two things about this is Christ. Uh, priestly prayer for uh, his church, for his disciples, the original 12 apostles that he chose, plus all of those who follow Jesus by faith, that God has called us to follow Jesus by faith. And um, he is beginning this prayer uh, to the one, the only one, who should ever be called Santa Papa, Holy Padre, Holy Father. The only one who should be called Holy Father is God Almighty. No man should, if, if, if the man, if there was ever a Pope that had a conscience, he would undo 1,700 years of Catholic tradition and dogma and say, do not call me Holy Father. That title belongs only to God. Amen to that. So John chapter 17, let's start in verse 1 and read our way down. Uh, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee. Uh, we've talked about that. And as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that thou might know thee, or that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. To me, it's funny. When I listen to people in the new age, people uh, who are, have these... Bumper stickers on their car that says coexist 
on them. Uh, that just, I, I laugh at it. Because if you look at those symbols on that decal that they have, those religions have never gotten along, ever, since the history of these religions, they have never gotten along with any other religion. There is right now, uh, people have been telling me about it, there is right now uh, in uh, the Middle East, there is a, 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 a center being built and it's a, it's a multicultural worship center. It's called the Abrahamic Faith Worship Center and it includes uh, Jews, Christians, and Muslims because all three of those religions claim that they are descendants from Abraham either by birth, in the case of the Arab nations, they are birthed through Ishmael. In the case of the Jews, they are birthed through Isaac. In the case of, uh, <laughs> in the case of any Christian who would ever belong to that, they're birthed of their father the devil. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, uh, they say that, you know, we are of the faith of Abraham. And so it basically is trying to unite these three primary and three largest and most influential religions on the earth, trying to unite them together. And there may be a bunch of them that all want to sing Kumbaya and hold hands and all this stuff. The rest of them want to like... Let's kill the Jews first and then we'll kill the Christians. Or let's get rid of the Muslims first. Then we won't have any problems anymore. And that's just how it is. And, uh, but here Jesus is saying, in no uncertain terms, and, 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 and it, the UFO people say this, the New Age people say this, they all say that us Christians, we've got it all wrong, that the, our Bible is all wrong. Jesus didn't come to set up a unique religion centered only upon himself. He came as a representative of the star people who are coming to bring a, uh, a new age of enlightenment to this world. And I'm going, that's funny. Those people telling me how I think I, how they think I ought to believe. Or telling me that I don't know my religion and know what it says. I know what it says. And I'm looking right here and he says that they might know thee, the only true God. There's only one. And Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. And he meant Jesus Mentioned nothing of Muhammad or Allah. He mentioned nothing of Buddha. He mentioned nothing of that. And so Jesus said, this religion is exclusive. No man cometh to the Father but by me. So he said, I have glorified thee on the earth and have finished the work which thou hast given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they are, or thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have uh, kept thy word. We talked about how this prayer is Christ uh, acting as the mediator. Christ is, he's the mediator and he is the intercessor. And what that word means is Christ is um, acting as uh, not only a mediator between us and God, but Christ is the one who is carrying our prayers directly to God. It is clear from scriptures that man by himself does not have the right to go directly to God. We cannot do it. And any organization or any, um, any prayer or anything like this, I, I was talking to a man one time that, that was a, a Freemason. And I, I, he wanted to know why I had a problem with Freemasonry. I said, well, I'll tell you one of them. You guys pray at your meetings, right? Yeah. Whose name do you pray in? Well, we don't use any name. We just pray to the great architect of the universe and he hears our prayer. And I said, I bet, I bet he doesn't. 
Why would you say that? I said, because you don't pray in the name of Jesus Christ. And the answer was, well, we don't want to offend. We have people in our lodge that are Jews and, and things like that. We, we don't want to offend them. I said, yeah, but the Bible says that there is only one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. And I said, if those people belong to an organization that's going to pray the way God told us to pray and they're offended by that, then let them leave. You don't change your prayer to pacify the demands of people who refuse Jesus Christ. You don't change your religion. You don't change your dogma. You don't change your doctrine. You don't change anything for that. If anything needs to be changed, it's their attitude about who Jesus is and about how to approach God. Amen. So we already dealt with that. So I'm not talking about that. Um, what I want to get to tonight is uh, we talked about him being glorified and we've gone through all of this now and, and let me read these verses very quickly and then we'll move into the next part of it. Psalm 104 31 the glory of the Lord shall endure forever the Lord shall rejoice in his works and remember the glory of the Lord is Christ. He is always going to represent the glory of the Lord and what is what is God's glory? It's, it's God in his brilliance. It's God in his radiance. When you see God, you know it's God. If you happen to go out uh, in the morning and you see the sun up in the sky, and at some times we know that also in the morning you can see the moon because it hasn't, it hasn't vanished away yet. Is it hard to tell which one's the moon and which one's the sun? How do we tell, John? It's a lot brighter. And which one's going to last? The sun's going to last. It's a lot brighter. We'll know it because of that. And so whenever God is shining forth his glory, it is an unmistakable glory. Now, I was thinking about this the other day. Uh, we know that in 2 Corinthians 11, if you want to turn there, if you don't, then you'll just miss out. But in 2 Corinthians 11, um, Paul warns us about Satan and his appearing. He says in verse 13, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Now that bears witness to what we see in Isaiah 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? And that Luce is a Latin word for light. Okay? Um... Anything that's lucent or if a person is not drunk, they're completely sober. We say they are lucid. OK, uh, somebody that's been in a car accident or had, you know, they the, they got pushed over by a dog. OK, Paige got pushed over by a dog and it kind of there was like birds flying around her head going tweet, 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 tweet. And I said, Paige, do not leave and go anywhere until you are 100% and can think straight. Well, she needs to be lucid. That means the light has to be on fully. Okay? So we use that, we use that idea. And so here is, um, here is Lucifer, the light bearer. And um, if we look in Ezekiel, Ezekiel, yeah, Ezekiel 28. We get a description, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentation, Ezekiel. We get a description of Lucifer that this is how God made him. God made him with musical instruments. We know that. Um, we know that like in verse 3 of Ezekiel 28, thou art wiser than Daniel. God made him smart. But I want you to notice verse uh, 13 this is Lucifer now. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. 
Every precious stone was thy covering. Now think of these gems. Sardius. Topaz. Diamonds. What do diamonds do? They sparkle. And if you notice, if you go to jewelry stores, jewelry stores have lights aiming straight down on their jewelry cases. They want those gems to sparkle in that light. Why? Because that's what draws us to them. That's what gives them their worth. I mean, no one, no, no, no bride to be ever goes around showing everybody her sandstone engagement ring. Look what he got me. They want that sucker to shine. Amen. And so here is Lucifer, Sardius, Topaz, Diamond, Beryl, Onyx, Jasper, Sapphire, Emerald, Carbuncle, Gold. And I was thinking of this. How many, how many performers, like music performers, country music, um, rock music, whatever, how many of these, male or female, will wear a wardrobe that is full of sparkly things? All of them. Okay? Why is that? Maybe, maybe there's a little bit of Lucifer going on there. That's the spirit. Here they are playing instruments because Satan has these built in the workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes. And then another verse says thy vials in Isaiah 14, thy vials, your stringed instruments. So a lot of musicians... They like to be seen with those shiny wardrobes, okay? That just kind of came into my mind the other day, but, or, or yesterday, I think. So anyway, that's who Lucifer is, and he likes to be transformed into, a, into a, a, an angel of light. However, again, if Satan appeared in the night sky and he is just beaming with these lights. And Jesus appeared next to him. Would anybody have a problem figuring out who's who? Uh -uh. They may not want to pick Jesus. But there's no doubt who's who. His glory. His, the glory of the Lord shall endure forever. Okay. Uh, silver tarnishes. The first instrument that I ever got to play, where's my grandchildren, Jaden? The first instrument I got to play in sixth grade was a French horn. My mom and dad couldn't, couldn't afford to buy a French horn from the school because they just, we just didn't have the money. And, the, and Mrs. Wegman said, don't worry, we've got one for him. And it was an old, old French horn. It was bent and everything like that. It was all brown and everything like that. And I took a, 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 a can of Brasso. You know what that is? And I rubbed on that thing until you could brush your teeth in it. Okay? I mean, I, got, I wanted that thing to look. I was proud of that instrument. I wanted it to look nice. Okay? Well, I found out that that didn't last. And pretty soon I was asking mom and dad, I need another jar of Brasso. Because I, I wanted to keep it nice looking. Uh, the glory of the Lord shall endure forever. Isaiah 40, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Habakkuk 2, it, just because right now people say that they don't believe in Christ or they believe in Christ, but he is, he is one teacher among many teachers or that, uh, you know, God goes by many names and everybody's going to see their God and so on. Uh-uh. On this day, everybody's going to see the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they're going to know it. Habakkuk 2.14. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. 
Luke 2, 9, the angel of the Lord came upon them. The glory of the Lord shone round about them. Why? Because they, because they were announcing Jesus on this earth. Um, 2 Corinthians 3, 18, we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image. You know what that means? When we are given our new body, we're going to shine just as bright as Jesus is. I cannot even fathom it. Now, here's, here's what God wants more than anything. How many gods did the Hindus worship? 330 million gods. There's no way that you can have that you can know the names of all of those gods. And I would say that there's no way that you could know whether or not you offended a certain God because you don't know what's God and what isn't. But God has a plan. He had it intended for us in our lives. That. Uh, John, I'll use you for example. You wandered in a godless wilderness. But one day, God made himself so real to you, you knew then who God was. And you didn't question it anymore. I know who God is. So look what he says here, Exodus 6. And I will take you to, to me for a people, and I will be to you a God, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. Exodus 7, same thing. And the Egyptians, the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. You think Pharaoh figured it out by the time he wakes up and he finds his firstborn son dead? He knows he can't beat this God. Get these people out of here. In verse 17, thus saith the Lord, in this thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Exodus 8, 22. And I will sever in that day the land of Goshen in which my people dwell that no swarms of flies shall be there to the end that thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. And, and is this like what I've been telling you when the Israelites were in the land of Goshen and God was pouring out all these plagues to Egypt, all their cattle was dying. And it's like you had a straight line of dead cattle. Down this straight line, and on the other side of that line, cattle feeding. And nothing affected them. You had a wall of flies going all the way up to as high as you could see up into the heaven. And not a single fly over in the land of Goshen. Now you would look at that and you would say, how is that possible? But that's how it was. Absolute, complete darkness over all of Egypt. Darkness, they said, that you could feel. It was a darkness that, uh, I heard a guy explain it, you could light a candle, feel the heat from the candle, but couldn't see the flame. That's how thick it was. And again, a light shining all the way down the line that separated the land of Goshen from the land of Egypt. And it's like you step over here and you're in darkness and you step over here and you're in complete light and you're going, that's the weirdest thing I've ever seen in my life. And, and you're figuring out, if you're, if you're a Jew, you're figuring it out. If you're an Egyptian, you've got it figured out. That's their God. Their God apparently is way more powerful than ours because we cannot make this darkness go away. Um, that they may know uh, that I am that I am the Lord. Uh, he says in verse seventeen, Exodus eight twenty two, um, I will sever in that day the land of Goshen, that they may us know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Uh, Exodus fourteen four. This is where he's going to take them now to the Red Sea and to Israel. As they're walking through the midst of the Red Sea, they're walking on dry sand. And they're looking at fish, looking at them. 
And I, I like to think that every now and then a fish would flop out of that wall of water. And it's like, oh, we get a fish too. Or you could just reach in there and grab one. That was easy. And they were just watching fish swim around in that, and they're, they're going, how does that happen? Well, God was doing it. And God says, that way they'll know that I'm the Lord. But then Pharaoh looks at this, and Pharaoh's, all of Pharaoh's gods, he knows he doesn't have a God that can do this. And he said that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. In verse 18, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh and upon his chariots, upon his horsemen. So Pharaoh decides, it's a brilliant tactic that I'm going to do. I'm going to follow them down inside that uh, dry land there that God has created. And I'm going to catch up to them in my chariots. Thought it was a good idea. And what did God do to the chariots? Let the air out of their tire. <laughs> I saw a video of the kid. You know how they play these little clips of just stupid stuff happening, you know? And this dad, apparently it was time for school. So this kid sneaks out to his dad's car. <laughs> sticks something in the, tire, in the side of the tire of his dad's car and runs back in the house thinking he got away with something. Now dad can't take us to school. You will know that I am the Lord, your God, buddy. Okay. Um, Exodus 16. And I've heard the murmurings of the children of Israel speak unto them, saying, At even you shall eat flesh, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord, your God. The manna given to them that just appeared out of heaven, out of nowhere. Every morning from that day forward for 40 years, the Israelites got up and the whole ground was covered with this, what looks like a coriander seed. And they were able to scoop that up every day, grind it into their flour so they can make their cakes, their bread or whatever it is they made and, and eat that. And that was their food every day. The Bible says they ate angels food, the food of angels. And God says, so you'll know that I am the Lord, your God. Well, the New Testament version of that is Christ. And there is every day we wake up, there's Christ all over again. Anew for us. And we wake up and there's more bread for us that came down from heaven. And when we read the Bible, we know who God is. Amen. We don't question it. Um. I've got a story to tell. I'm not going to tell it tonight. But I had, a, I had an outstanding phone call this week from an old friend of mine. Goes back to my Bible college days. And all I'm going to say is God has brought him to a place to where he now knows things that for years I prayed that God would show him. And God has. I didn't teach it to him. God did it. And I'm like, I love you, God. Okay? Uh, now, is Christ, has he always been Christ? In other words, now you're shaking your head, but I'm I'm. going to ask you ha! to tell me from memory I'm a Jehovah's Witness and mind you a Jehovah's Witness Bible and I figured this out one time because a team came to my house years ago and they had their Bible but I noticed that it was like Old New Testament. And then as thick as this part of as, as thick as my Bible is, they had that much at the end of the Bible full of answers to possible questions that people or objections that people would give them on the door. And while I was talking to the man, 
and giving him my objections why I am not ever going to be a Jehovah's Witness. His wife is looking my questions up in the back, looking and to get the answers on how to answer me and make me look like a fool in front of my, and basically to show me how wrong I am. Okay? And I, and I thought that I had that figured out, and when uh, Brady came along, I asked Brady, I said, is that, is that how that Bible is made? He said, that's exactly right. You're pretty good picking that out. I said, because I could see her. Every time I brought something up, she was going... And she'd nudge him, look at here, you know, like this, and he would give me this answer. So, I'm a Jehovah's Witness, and I'm knocking on your door. And uh, I'm, I want to come in and teach you about the real Jesus. Not the one that the churches have lied to you about, but the real Jesus. The real Jesus, um, we call him the Son of God. But nowhere in the Bible, and here's what I'm going to say to you as a, as a Jehovah's Witness. Nowhere in the Bible does it ever call Jesus God. I'm going to say that to you. Okay? And then I'm going to quote for you some um, Protestant ministers' sayings from certain reference materials that they have access to and say... You know, um, there was a pastor who lived in England about 200 years ago, and he wrote a, a book on the divinity of Christ, and he concluded that at no time did the early church ever consider Jesus as being equal to God or being, being divine like God. And they're going to bring up things like that. And so how are you going to answer me? Yes, Alicia, you got your hand up. Oh, she's scratching her head. Okay, now, but wait a minute. But that was translated incorrectly. In the original Greek, it says that in the beginning was the word, the Logos. And the Logos was a God, is how the Greek really is translated. Was a God. So, that verse in your Bible is really not translated. And, I'll, and I'm going to give you some other source from some liberal theologian, and you don't know that though, that's going to attest to the fact that that verse really isn't speaking of Christ. That's how I'm going to get around it, okay? Who else can... John? Right. Okay. Okay. Now I don't know how they'll answer that back, but that's a good verse. Yes, sir. You got a verse for me. Huh? Very good. Very good. Who's got another one? Yes? But does that mention Jesus specifically? Huh? Okay. Yes? Okay. Yes. First uh, John uh, five, verse one says, Whoever whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that believeth him that begat uh begat loveth him also that be that begotten of him. And then down in verse five it says, Who is who 
is he that overcome the world but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? Okay. Now, I will tell you that Jehovah's Witness will, um, they will say that they believe that Jesus was the Son of God. Yeah, not, not, but not God, God. Okay. To which, you know, all, all you got to do is say is, is, see that dog over there? That dog's father gave life to that dog. That dog is the son of a dog. The son of a dog is a dog. And the son of God is God. Amen? If it barks like a dog and rolls over like a dog and rises from the dead like a dog, amen? So, uh, now I'll put my verses up on the screen. Come on. Go ahead. Matthew 16, where Jesus is asking the disciples, But whom say ye that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Son of God. Yeah. Now again, a lot of those... Uh, you won't you won't make it too far with Jehovah's Witness if you keep trying to go the route of the Son of God because they will they will they will submit that yes we do believe he is the Son of God he's just not God okay it's like the other angels like in Genesis six the sons of God or uh, Psalm eighty two I have said ye are gods all of ye are children of the Most High they will use that and say that Christ is like those other sons of God and that he was created a lesser, 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 lesser God so that he could create the universe, okay? Now, yeah, um, I don't know, I have to get Brady over here. Matthew. Right. And now, to throw a wrench in your gears on that one. Charles Taze Russell did not originate these ideas that his cult believes about Jesus. They go all the way back to the, um, the, uh, the Gnostics. The Gnostics believe that God, the God, is so mystical and so far above everything else that there's no way man can know him, no even really know anything about him. He's so far removed from us. So that when God wanted to create everything, he created a lesser God than himself, a demigod, who created a demigod, who created a demigod, who created... And they got to a point to where this particular demigod was named Jesus, and Jesus then created all of the worlds. Okay, the universe, the sun, moon, and the stars. So they would use that verse to say, that's what we believe. We believe that Jesus did create everything, but he had to because the real God is too high and holy to create material things. Okay, so let's look at this. John 17, 5 says, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. They shared the exact same glory. And God, there's, God said in the Old Testament, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not share with another. So if God won't share his glory with anything except God, but he shares it with Christ, Christ is God. 
John 1, 2, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. In other words, he was pre-existent. He was already there in the beginning with God. Um, John 3, 13, and no man hath ascended up, but he that came down, which is in heaven. John 5, 26, for as the Father hath life in himself. In other words, who created God? Who gave God life? Nobody. He had life in himself. The Bible says, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. So who created Christ? Nobody. He already had life in in himself, exactly the way the Father did. And what you're looking at is the same attributes of God the Father are the same as God the Son. Then, John 8, 54, Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet, ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say, I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him. And keep this saying, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, thou art not yet 50 years old. And hast thou seen Abraham? Derek? I am. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Or as this guy, I, we used to sing, I am. Okay. Okay. And, and the name, I am, Jesus is taking on himself. I am. Not, I was, or not, I showed up one day, or not, I was created. I am. Well, that's God's name and title and being. Yes, before Abraham was, I am. I already am. Um, John 17, 24. Father, and this is John 17 again, back to that chapter. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of of the world. I've always been with you, Father. Always. Romans 1.20 For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. Even His eternal power and Godhead. Christ is the one who's referenced as His. Christ has Eternal power, which means, eternal means, eternal all the way back that way, eternal now, and eternal that way. That's how, that's the only way we can understand eternity because we're based on time. So we say eternity past, eternity present, eternity future. But Romans says that Christ always had power and he was always part of the Godhead. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Uh, Ephesians 3.11, according to the eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. How far back before the creation did God determine that Christ was going to be the Savior of a world that had not even been created yet? All the way back into eternity. E eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus. First, uh, and by the way, Finnis Dake said, made this statement that Christ was not made Christ, the anointed one, until he was born in Jerusalem. In other words, before Luke chapter 2, Jesus was not Christ and never was. That's stupid. That guy's an idiot. And I know where he is, too. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.17, Now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, 
the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. How long has Jesus been the king? Eternity. Immortal. Eternity. 2 Timothy 2.10 Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. That glory that Jesus said that we share before the world was, that was an eternal glory. It never had a beginning and it doesn't have an end. Uh, Hebrews 9, 12, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us, which means, and this blows our mind, that our sins were forgiven before we ever committed them. How can that be? Because Christ was slain from the foundation of the world. Having uh, obtained eternal salvation of redemption for us, for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, that they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. The inheritance is eternal because Christ is eternal. John chapter 1, verse 3, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Ephesians 1, 4, According as he hath chosen in us before him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him, in love. How long before the foundation of the world? The, the phrase how long doesn't exist in eternity. We will not say to each other when we're in heaven, how long have you been here? Well, no, nobody will say that. We'll go, we're here. We're here. Uh, Hebrews 1.10, Thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. Christ was already there in the beginning laying the foundation. He's the creator. Oh, I like this one. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. Catholic Church loves silver and gold. So do a lot of preachers, I know. So this is why on TBN, all of these preachers will promise you riches untold and health and all these promises. But you must kick out the silver and gold from your bank account to theirs before you get it. They're telling you that you can be redeemed and blessed by God by silver and gold. It's a lie. From your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. But with the precious blood of Jesus as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. But was manifest in these last times for you. So how long was Christ the lamb? Always. Before the world. How long before the world? That is an impossible question with absolutely no answer. Because how long does not apply in a realm where time is not measured. And we can't even fathom that. Okay? Uh, Revelation 13, 8. All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. How long has your name been written in the book of life? Forever. Ever before forever and always forever mm, mm, mm. and it says here the same thing revelation 17 whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world bottom line is if your name hasn't been written in the book of life ain't gonna be ain't gonna be god already knows who is and who isn't? I'm going to leave you with one thing tonight. That um, a conversation with an old friend of mine had. And it just, it blessed me. Because it really was the path that God put me on. Uh, all the way back in 1997. 
was that I, I, I told God, or God told me, Mike, don't read anybody else's prophecy books. Read mine. Um, this old friend of mine, he was getting his doctorate in theology. And one of his professors was a dyed-in-the-wool John Calvin reborn on this earth. He was a Calvinist, strict Calvinist through and through. They believe in a limited atonement. Christ didn't die for everybody. He only died for the elect and so on and so on and so on. And this friend of mine would have debates with him, not heated debates, not, you know, but they would often talk. And if some of the other students who favored this professor uh, was talking to this f friend of mine, they would run back to this professor and tell him some of the things that this friend of mine said in their debate. So the guy would be able to retort back and show him how wrong he was. The professor was on getting on up in years and um, he's now dead. And this friend of mine went to visit him uh, before he died. And this old professor, this old Calvinist professor, told my friend, he said, I'm going to tell you something. He said, I, I've never told another human being. But he said, it dawned on me one day that I've been looking at the scriptures through the lens of an institution. But one day, God allowed me to start looking at the institution through the lens of the scriptures. And he said, I realized that I was propping up ideas and doctrines that the Bible was not propping up. And I, boy, I mean, doodads went up and down. I, a little tear came to my eye. And this friend of mine, he was going through that right then. And I told him, I said, you know, most of the following that we have in our church are people who got tired of being told what they had to believe, what they had to think, concerning what's in the Bible. And they come out of that looking for someone who would lead them. And I said, that's the first thing that God did to me is say, Mike, quit looking at what you were told to believe. Look at what I said first. And uh, that's the way to do it, people. That's the way to do it. In, God will lead you. God will bless you for that. Okay?